Oh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I'm assuming, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's take a look at the participant box here. Ah, uh, okay. Playing games with me. In any case, um, welcome to the program this afternoon. And uh, let's just one set of rules, very straightforward. Uh, we've got a chat box and we've got a Q&A box. And so what we want to do is uh, confine the course, the, the, the uh, conversation between the participants and the presenter to the Q&A box. And if there's an administrative issue that you need to deal with, uh, you can do that in the chat box. That way, uh, the boss and I each have our own little box that we watch. And uh, so let's, uh, with, with that as a preface, uh, happy holidays, everybody. And uh, uh, let's, let's just do something quickly. Uh, wait a minute. I just tried to look at the participant box and it didn't want to, uh, it didn't want to show it. Oh, wait. All right. Here we go. No, I did it. Uh, let, let's make sure the raise hand buttons work also. I'm just curious, how many people here are actually working in the photovoltaics uh, area uh, or renewable energy, any any part of renewable energy? Raise your hand if you're working in the renewable energy industry. Uh -huh. That's a uh, respectable percentage. I've got uh, five hands raised here. Okay, so in any case, uh, we're going to go into a fair amount of detail today. There are some webinars, uh, you've all been involved, we all have, where there are general information type webinars where you don't necessarily walk out uh, having an idea of how to do something. Uh, more than uh, as much as you have an idea of what somebody else might have done. Uh, hopefully, everybody will walk out today with an idea of how you might do your own battery backup system. So let's get started, because if we don't get started, we'll never reach that point. Um, <clears throat> there's a number of different kinds of, of backup systems. One is the whole house backup system, and that would look like this. Uh, you've got the utility coming in, that set of closed contacts there is a set of contacts that we'll talk about quite a bit. Uh, if the utility goes down, that set of contacts has to open, just like if you had a gasoline generator or a natural gas generator. Because if you're going to dump power into your house while the utility is down, the last thing you want is to be dumping power out onto the power line, especially if something is broken and they need to fix it because transformers work both directions. You can put 100 or 240 volts on, one, on your side and you get 7,600 on the other side. And that's enough to make a maintenance person very unhappy. So in any case, uh, this is a whole house backup simply because you shut off the utility and everything on the uh, solar side of the <laughs> set of contacts is connected to the solar and the energy storage system. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and, and so that provides you with your backup electricity uh, if the utility is down. There's also a partial house backup option, and that might look like this, where you simply have a bunch of interruptible loads in a main distribution panel, and then you have your battery backup and uh, control system uh, such that it, uh, if the utility goes down, the interruptible loads do not have power, but everything on the other side of the contacts in the control box uh, has power from the energy storage system and the renewable energy source. And that goes off to that standby panel with uninterruptible loads. So those are the two basic uh, types of backup, but then we can split that up in different directions as well. Let's see what we have for a question here. 
May we get a copy of the slides? Absolutely. And in fact, uh, Joseph, um, uh, if you put that question in the chat box, the host will uh, respond with exactly what you need to do to get a PDF copy of the slides. And by the way, feel free to use them for anything you want to use them for. Uh, I own the copyright and I consider it a privilege if somebody thinks they're worth looking at a second time around. So, uh, uh, and if you want to talk about them over dinner or show them to a friend, that's fine too. Um, so, um, and, and also, if you do order up a set of slides, uh, we are not going to be going through every single slide. There was several, several additional examples are in an appendix that will be available to those who order the slides. So uh, thank you for asking that up front. Now we everybody knows the answer. I hesitate a little bit after um, uh, questions because I have to click on a few things to shut down the question so I don't answer it twice. Okay, in addition to the whole house and the uh, <clears throat> partial uh, inverter, why am I having trouble speaking this afternoon? I've never had that trouble before, as far as I know. Okay, anyway, um, with the battery backup system, it really is pretty much all about the inverters. They have to comply with a lot of things. Uh, they, they have a lot of different things they do compared with the straight grid connected or even the inverter that uh, runs the uh, off-grid system. The battery backups have quite a bit of stuff going on. Um, when everything is working, that is when utilities up and when any excess electricity made by the solar system um, goes back to the grid, it has to be good electricity. So it has to be a good sine wave and so it has to meet certain IEEE 1547-2018 uh, requirements to do that, which means a clean sine wave, basically. And it's a current source, and that's important, too. Uh, there is a difference between a current source and a voltage source. Most of us are used to voltage sources. Plug something into the wall, that's the voltage source. Your car battery, that's the voltage source. Any other battery you've got is a voltage source. But when it goes to a, a, a inverter, the inverter maintains a constant current as opposed to, or it maintains whatever amount of current it can maintain. So that's an important thing to remember because that helps the inverters to meet all the rest of the requirements they have to keep the utility happy. Um, if the utility goes down, then you need a voltage source because that's what the loads in your occupancy are accustomed to seeing. And if they don't see a voltage source, at a nice steady voltage, then they become unhappy. And if the voltage goes too high, uh, they could burn out. And if it goes too low, if they're a motor, they could burn out as well, because when the voltage drops, the current goes up and that makes things heat up. So even too low a voltage can be a problem. Um, they charge batteries when the batteries connected to the system need to be charged. So, uh, and if the sun isn't up, then the, the grid will do it if it's there. Um, the input to the inverters is the battery voltage in general. Now, th th this is in a uh, system where we're dividing it up into a whole lot of different components. We're going to see how the, uh, the ancient historic systems work, the ones that I used to work on back in uh, 20 years ago. And uh, a lot of improvements have been made and, and those improvements to a great extent are consolidating a lot of the, the uh, individual parts into single boxes to make things a lot simpler. So we're gonna break these things down into their basic parts. It's kind of like the assemble and disassemble things you may have done in a shop class. Uh, I don't know, maybe only 80 year old guys like me have had it that shop class where we took things apart and put them back together to learn how they work. Um, but that's basically the approach we're gonna use. We're gonna use the old approach because the basic principles are all still the same. And then we're gonna show how those basic principles are applied to the modern systems today. And uh, there's a lot of them out there. 
uh, come, uh, I'm working for a former student of mine, and uh, I think we've probably uh, designed systems with uh, pretty close to uh, 10 megawatts hours of uh, storage, and these are all at the residential level. Okay, so uh, well, we can't uh, sit around on to any one slide very long because otherwise we won't make it to the end. So uh, because now the, the, the individual inverters don't normally do ground fault detection interruption or arc fault, but uh, the modern ones do, the older ones didn't. Uh, they have to have a rapid shutdown system. We'll go talk about that in the examples. Uh, they're not very noisy. The grid goes down and you don't get blown away by, by the uh, exhaust from a natural gas or a fossil generator. They save on trips to the gas station. They're UL1741 compliant. UL1741 is a testing procedure that verifies that they uh, meet the uh, standards of IEEE 1547-2018. And we'll talk a little bit about what that does uh, as we move on. So, and uh, a lot of them have provisions for connecting in and including a fossil fuel emergency backup power, just in case your batteries run dry and the sun goes down. Of course, there's always a possibility that your fossil generator will run out of gas too. So uh, nothing's perfect. There are two types of battery backup grid connected systems. Uh, I thought we already didn't already say there are two different types. Uh, well, the, then then the uh, of the whole house and the partial house, uh, each of those can be done two different ways. Um, one is a DC coupled system. <clears throat> and uh, I'm just going to let you read this later because we're going to see a picture of it in just a minute. And there's an AC coupled system. And uh, one might wonder, what is the difference between a DC coupled system and an AC coupled system? And if you're going to be a designer, you really do need to understand the difference. So we're going to take a look at these systems so everybody will understand what's going on here. Here we have a DC coupled system. All right, and it's broken down into the finest components of it. These used to be individual boxes, but now a lot of these boxes are all consolidated into the green one. Uh, but we start with solar array up on the roof. It sends power down to a source circuit combiner box. There may be six or seven circuits, and basically what we're looking at is something that is uh, it is similar to a, a regular uh, distribution panel in that source circuit combiner box. The only difference is the skinny wires are the ones that deliver the power to the box and the fat ones are the ones that take it out rather than the other way around. So uh, this source circuit combiner box, who knows, might uh, combine up to 80, 100, over 100 amps, depending on the size of the system. And out of it, it goes to a charge controller. And that charge controller is there because there's a couple of reasons. One, is that you want to be sure that you maximize the amount of power that you get out of your array. And the charge controller is going to have circuitry in there to, to make sure that happens. And the charge controller has to make sure that the batteries don't get overcharged or for that matter, over discharged because that can be very unfortunate with certain technologies. Uh, right now with mostly lithium out there, over just discharge is not much of an issue but you don't dare go overcharge them or then they can get warm and then you have your problem. So the charge controller is in control of that. Now, in fact, we'll see that with lithium systems, the charge controller is called the battery management system. And it's actually an electronic, very complex electronic system that is a part of the battery itself. Uh, and we're gonna get to that. Um, Note the directions of the arrows. The power comes out of the PV array, goes into the source circuit combiner box, gets combined, goes to the charge controller, all one direction, comes out of the charge controller, nothing goes back into it. It comes out from the bottom. Then it goes to storage batteries, and you have a bidirectional power flow at the storage batteries. <clears throat> and then you've got bidirectional power flow 
such that when the storage batteries don't need the electricity coming out of the charge control, it will go to the uh, the inverter, provided that the inverter has something to do with it. And as you can see, the inverter will either send electricity to standby loads or it will send it to a distribution panel or it will uh, accept power from a distribution panel from the utility if and, and feed the standby loads when utility is up. Now, the flow of power from the PV array, first choice is the battery, second choice is the standby loads, third choice is the, dis the main distribution panel with interruptible loads in it, and fourth choice is it goes back to utility if none of those others need it, or whatever fraction is not needed, it goes back to utility. Okay, so this is a DC coupled system. Why is it called DC? Simply because everything from the PV array to the source circuit combiner box to the charge controller to the storage batteries to the input of the battery backup inverter is DC. Okay, and once it gets in there, then it gets converted to AC and goes either to the standby loads or to the point of utility connection. Okay. Here is an AC coupled system, a little bit different. Starts with the PV array and it goes directly to a direct grid connect inverter. So as soon as it comes down off the roof or perhaps before it comes down off the roof with Riker inverters that we'll see later, that AC electricity is AC by the time it gets uh, out of that grid connect inverter. And then it goes directly to the standby loads. What's the advantage there? The efficiency of that direct grid connect inverter is roughly 98%. So therefore, 98% of the available PV uh, power uh, can be, uh, almost 98% can be delivered to the standby loads. Uh, this standby panel can have additional uh, uh, AC loads or AC sources, whether it's wind, low head hydro, or whatever, uh, as long as that orange source underneath the standby loads complies with IEEE 1547 or UL 1741, this, the uh, uh, testing uh, compliance, uh, then, then we're good to have additional uh, sources. Now, you probably realize that seems kind of strange, doesn't it? But the, the reason you can do this is because you have a sing, single synchronizing signal coming out of the green inverter to the standby load panel and any other inverter connected to that seeds that signal coming out of the green inverter and it's them automatically synchronizes with the green inverter because this stuff is all electronic. So it happens in, in milliseconds or less that the uh, electricity from the direct grid connect inverter immediately senses that electricity from the battery backup inverter. And uh, well, it, it, it's possible though that it will wait five minutes because that's another one of these uh, UL 1741 requirements that the uh, direct grid connect inverter will not uh, necessarily connect to the standby loads until it sees that there is power from the utility going to the standby loads or power from the battery backup inverter when utility is down going to the standby loads. When that's the case, then the direct grid connect inverter is perfectly happy to convert the DC from the array into AC and send it off to the standby loads. All right, so uh, the difference then is that this AC out uh, connection on the battery backup inverter is a little bit misleading because that's just a connection to an AC bus bar. And in the DC coupled mode, AC does come out of there, but in the AC coupled mode, it is okay to feed electricity in the back door in the form of AC electricity, which will then go through the battery charger and the battery backup inverter, which is also, also called a hybrid inverter. And it will charge the batteries if they need it, and if they don't need it, it goes back up to the point of utility connection into the distribution panel and out to the utility if the utility is there. Now, you might see that there's an interesting possibility here that uh, if the utility is down, it's possible the storage batteries will run low 
And if that's the case, then the battery backup inverter has to notice that and it has to shut down. And unfortunately, then there's no more power to the standby loads. The other thing though, is when that happens and the sun comes up in the morning, you want to recharge everything. And that means that this direct grid connect inverter, which is hoping to get a message from the green inverter that it's okay to turn on, that means the green inverter has to have a communication to the direct grid connect inverter. So those two will synchronize when sun comes back up the next morning. So there has to be a little energy left in those storage batteries to keep the green inverter happy in order to be for it to be able to turn on the blue inverter. Okay, so here, that's, that's the difference between AC and DC. So uh, the storage batteries are charged by AC in this case. You see, there's no DC going to the storage battery. Well, yeah, there is definitely DC going to the storage batteries, but it's converted into DC within the battery backup inverter. Now, as we look at some of the modern systems, we'll find out that, in fact, some of the storage batteries have their very own uh, AC to DC converters within in order to charge the DC batteries because the batteries are always DC. So if they get their DC from AC by converting it, uh, that's okay. Uh, and that also means their DC coming out in order to get back into the rest of the world has to be converted back to AC before it goes anywhere. So just a couple of things to keep in mind. And now we can move on and we can look at some basics. And nobody does this anymore, I have to tell you. But we're going to do it today just so you can get an idea of what is the capability of a backup system. And we'll see why nobody does this anymore as we move on through. But I think it helps a lot to understand what you're dealing with with these systems because I can tell you that they are changing almost by the week with little minor changes to the inverter or to a controller or to whatever. And if you understand how the overall system is supposed to work, it's a whole lot easier to read the data sheet and whatever change they may have made to it. All right, so um, we're gonna make this list, all right? And uh, uh, I'll write this, uh, we'll just mark it down because um, once we know what we're going to do, we'll draw, we'll have, here it is, like this. And so here we're going to do a DC coupled system. And it's going to be based on designating standby loads. Okay. So uh, the first thing you do is make a list of your loads. Now, again, like I say, this is not the first thing you're going to do, but this is the way we used to do it 15 years ago. And the reason was simply because the, the uh, PV systems of cells were relatively expensive. And so you didn't normally install a whole lot more than what you needed in order to back up your refrigerator, microwave, washing machine, computer, whatever. So make a list, just a lot like uh, doing a, uh, a load calculation, isn't it? Um, sorry about the phone, my friend seems to find uh, the best times of day to call. Uh, here's a question, let's take a quick look. How does the inverter detect loss of utility power? Oh, it just simply has a, a, basically a voltmeter connected across its input. And when that voltmeter goes down to zero, it knows there's no power and it uh, activates a whole series of, uh, uh, of switches that, and, and things that turns things off. So yeah, you got to remember that these inverters are all electronic. So electronically, there are so many different things you can measure that uh, it, it's a straightforward thing. And once again, this is why it's handy for the uh, inverter to be sensing the voltage. Not only does it sense how uh, the the the, uh, vo the voltage level, but it also senses the frequency. And this UL seventeen forty one requirement. Uh, in order to protect the rest of the world from this inverter coming on when it's not supposed to be delivering power to the utility, what happens is this inverter, well, let's see, how does it tell utility voltage voltage is producing? Okay, now that's why it's a current source, okay? The reason the current source goes, it drifts off 
And I don't, I don't think we have a picture of that here, but uh, what happens is the current source drifts off frequency unless utility voltage is present. If the utility is present at the, after every cycle, it resets the frequency of the current such that the current, and, and this happens in a matter of, of, of a couple milliseconds, a very short time, it gets a synchronization signal from the utility that says, hey, I'm here, guys, it's okay. And so therefore it keeps the, uh, it, 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 it keeps the inverter running. Uh, when the utility voltage goes down, the inverter notices that too, and it says, okay, I got to put on my voltage source hat now, and I have to behave like a voltage source rather than a current source. <clears throat> and once again, electronically, it's very straightforward, very straightforward to do that. Uh, so, uh, uh, Richard, hopefully that will take care of it, and uh, we're going to be and, and that's the whole reason why we're doing this right now is because we're going to be doing a lot of uh, uh, design examples here and I want you to understand the basics so that you'll understand the designs all right so this is a, you know you know maybe your house is different but the point is anybody can make a list like this and it's convenient to decide if you got 120 volts or 240 volts or maybe even 208 and you just divide it between uh, what line are you on? Is the refrigerator, is that on line one? Uh, microwave oven, line two. And see if you're putting in a separate uh, panel to do this backup, then this is how you can wire it on that. It's because it's gonna be a new panel anyway. You're simply gonna move the wires out of the old panel and into the new panel. So you can wire them in L1 and L2 like this if you want to. And notice the idea that it's trying to balance the two, two lines as well as possible. So you notice we have 16 amps on one line and 12.9 on the other, and that's about the best you can do here. And that's assuming everything's turned on anyway, and uh, that's never going to be the case, more than likely. So then uh, you, you look on the nameplate, the refrigerator, 144 watts. Uh, I know you electricians, electrical guys are saying, well, gee, when we uh, do a load calculation, we list the refrigerator at 1500. Yeah, that's because it's an appliance and appliance circuits are 1500. But if you look at the nameplate on the refrigerator, it's probably gonna be between 150, 200 watts, somewhere in that range. Microwave oven, washing machine. And again, these are on the imaginary kitchen and building that I created here. Uh, but whatever building you've got, you can look up the right answer if you uh, think they might be different. Uh, and then you have to guess uh, how long they're gonna run every day. And so therefore you look at the refrigerator, 144 watts, uh, one and a half amps, and uh, maybe run five, five six, uh, one and a half amps, like 144 watts is just a little over 200. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, 144 watts. Let's just look at the 144 watts part. Um, if that runs about eight hours a day, eight times 144 is how much? Uh, well, let's try 144 times eight happens to be. 11.52, all right, so that's uh, 1.15 kilowatt hours a day for the refrigerator. Uh, microwave oven at 900 watts, if you ran it for 1.1 hours, that would be a kilowatt hour a day, but most people don't have their microwave running for 1.1 hours, unless you're gonna uh, cook a chicken in it for dinner or something, but otherwise two minutes will heat a cup of coffee pretty fast. Uh, washing machine and so forth. So look at the yellow numbers on the bottom. <clears throat> the total load, everything on at the same time is 3,424 watts. So that means you'll probably want to design your inverter to make sure it can put out 3,424 watts. And you want to make sure that each side of the inverter uh, between line one and line two and ground, uh, notice that these are all 120 volt loads here. So you want the inverter to be able to put out at least 16 amps. And not only that, but you need your backup to put up, out at least 16 amps as well. And 
your storage is going to need to store 7.65 kilowatt hours a day if you go for a 24 hour period without any backup electricity. And that's pretty unusual because even on a dark day, like it's getting pretty dark again here in Florida and uh, looks like it's going to rain. And But if I had my pyranometer out there measuring sunlight intensity, it would probably be at about 25% right now. So even when it's cloudy, you're not losing everything, but you, you may lose uh, 70, 75% of what otherwise you get if we're really sunny. Uh, so in any case, uh, it's nice to start out with a load thing like this. It's nice practice. It helps you understand what's going on. Um, then once we know what the loads are, then we can select an inverter. What we know, it has to pass through 3,424 watts from the utility at 12240 volts. Um, and you need 16 amps for a line one. So if you can do 16 amps on line one, it'll be balanced. So we'll give you 16 on line two as well or more. And uh, uh, the other thing is the inverter does have a bus bar in it. And when your standby panel is connected, uh, when the grid is up, you may well want to use more power than uh, what's available. Uh, uh, but if the grid is up, that power might be available. And you have the option of manually shutting down some loads if you want to slow down your flow of electricity out of your batteries. Okay, so um, not unusual for a 120-240 volt inverter that will pass through somewhere 50 to 70 amps uh, when the grid is operational and it also has to supply 16 amps when the grid is down. Now, why would it supply 50 amps when the grid is up and 16 when the grid is down? Well, 50 amps is passed right through the inverter and the inverter doesn't touch it. All right, you just have to have fat enough wire for it to make its way through. But when the, the inverter is disconnected from the grid, then it's only going to take enough power from the batteries to supply 16 amps because that's what you need. Okay, so... Probably the inverter is going to use a 48 volt battery pack. All right. And uh, if this one, the old fashioned ones. And uh, now, so that doesn't mean there are no, none of these around. There's still are some out there. Um, it needs to be capable of charging batteries from the grid if it's down. So it's got a battery charger inside of it. The inverter can use DC and AC component enclosures for uh, like connecting up the batteries and the uh, uh charge controllers and so forth and uh for the uh the loads so this is the old-fashioned thing that has all these external parts and we're going to show in a real minute in, in a minute uh how we consolidate these all into a single inverter uh, all these uh, individual functions now, a couple of questions let's take a look on the first line, if 144 watts and the voltage is 120, how do I get current is one and a half amps? Oh, um, let's see. Uh, I think what I probably did there is assume that it was not a unity power factor. And uh, yeah, I, I, I hear you. 144 divided by 120 is uh, uh, not 1.5, but if you have an 80% power factor, that probably bumps it up to 1.5. So, uh, yeah, that's the other thing. And I'm glad you asked that, Dave, because uh, uh, it, it, uh, the, these electronic gadgets are perfectly happy to supply reactive power. Generally, they don't go much less than 85% uh, power factor, but uh, there are some out there that go between minus one and plus one. And uh, so, so, no, not minus one and That they, they they go from totally capacitive to totally to inductive uh, loads, um, but not very many do that. But I think uh, Tesla is, is not doesn't mind doing that. Usually, eighty five percent power factor is uh, about as low as they go either way, uh, leading or or lagging. So uh, yeah, thank you for that question. That's good. That's why we have interactive webinars. Let's see, what about startup loads? Um, 
Another excellent question. Um, these inverters are designed to recognize that, hey, they are have to, they're having to replace the utility. And most of them, if you look at their spec sheets, they will have a one second startup load that is rated about double what their continuous is. And they, so, so, so most of them are perfectly happy to start a refrigerator or maybe even a skill saw, something like that. Uh, air conditioners sometimes get a little iffy and you can get soft start uh, uh, components that you can put between the air conditioner and the inverter such that it will start the air conditioner a little slower without that big inrush to get the compressor going. So, so there's two ways they're handled and for the most part, you don't need any extra uh, equipment because the inverter can handle it. And that's one of the things you want to look at on the inverter specs. But if the inverter can't, then it is also possible to buy a soft start, which is an electronic mechanism that simply starts it up a little bit slower. But it gets it going because it recognizes that uh, it has to give it enough power for the thing to start rotating. Okay, uh, so what else we got? All charging set points are programmable, several battery technology choices. Okay, so um, let's look at some, some, some features of a couple of inverter models. Uh, and again, this is stuff, I'm not gonna read every word here because if you really wanna dig into this stuff, you'll, you'll order the slides and you can read through it again. But uh, we're, we're gonna look at some specs on, on two particular inverters. One's a 4,000 volt ampere. Notice here the rating is in volt amperes. So they're accounting for uh, uh, reactive power here or an 8,000 volt ampere unit. This is one manufacturer that makes some uh, inverters that still come close to looking functionally like the older ones from a while ago, even though they got better design, better components, and so forth. Um, so the the thing about these is they they uh, work with the legacy values of old inverters, and uh, uh, they do that with frequency shifting. Uh, that's the AC coupling. And what that means is that they can turn off or slow down that AC inverter that's connected to the grid, not to the grid, to, to, to the uh, uh, PV array. Uh, when the array is generating more power than is needed, what happens is these inverters uh, change their frequency. So the other inverter thinks the utility frequency is going up, and when the utility frequency goes up, then uh, that's a sign to the inverter to back off. So uh, again, that's one of the features and one of the convenience of having it as a current source, uh, but also not just sensing current or voltage, but sensing frequency, uh, because that gives it a message when it needs to slow down. Okay, partial list of technical specs. Here's the two inverters. And here we're talking about surge, and this answers most of those previous questions. Um, the 4000 VA machine will give you 8500 uh, VA for 100 milliseconds. That's a pretty good starting for inrush current. And for five seconds, you can have 6000. So that's 150% uh, uh, overload for five seconds. And uh, you can run. For 30 minutes, you can run this thing at 4,500 uh, VA, which is just a little over 10% overload. But the continuous power rating for three hours, it will run forever at 4,000 and it'll be perfectly happy as long as it's got the uh, input power to give it a chance to operate. Um, and notice that the 8,000 VA machine is basically two of the 4,000 VA machines. And you can see what the voltage ranges are. 40 to 64, that's DC battery voltage. 
All right, 122.40 is the AP output voltage. <laughs> and that, that's uh, generally you can get uh, uh, your full power. Some of them will not give you the full power at 120 volts. Uh, they'll maybe only give you 80% of full power at 120. You do have to have a little bit of power coming off each side for some of the units. And again, you, that's on the specs. Um, AC output current continuous 16.7 to 33.3. Ah, look at this uh, 16.7. We need 16. So it looks like 4,000 is, is looking good here so far. Uh, maximum AC input 50 amps at 240 volts. Um, DC input current at the rated volt ampere output 92 amps. Notice that 92 because it's a 48 volt DC input. So current times voltage equals current times voltage. If you have 48 volts, you need a lot more current to get the same power that you might have at 240 volts. And the continuous battery charging current, 57 and a half amps on a 4,000 VA machine. And uh, weighted efficiency, 92 and a half percent. Now there's your disadvantage on this machine. If you're going to go all the way through this machine before you start delivering AC power to a load, you're going to lose seven and a half percent. Whereas on the AC couple, uh, coupled machine, you're going through an, an inverter that doesn't have all these fancy features for charging batteries and all, but what it does have is the ability to operate at about 98% efficiency instead of 92.5% efficiency. And you know, that's not just a 5.5% uh, uh, increase in, fish, in efficiency. 98% uh, you've only got 2% losses, whereas you got 7.5% losses with 92.5%. So that's a significantly more uh, a uh, larger group of losses. And that's why the D DC coupled are kind of losing uh, favor to the AC couple these days. But it's kind of important to understand how they both work because there are still some DC coupled machines out there that use lithium and DC to DC converters and they run the batteries at 400 volts and da 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 da, we're gonna look at one of those <clears throat> and see that that one is a lot more efficient than this 92.5% stuff. So in any case, well, for what we need here, the 4,000 VA unit is fine. And we know that because we listed what we wanted to do. Had we not listed it, we could have put the 4,000 and said, well, let's just hope for luck. This ought to work. That's the seat of the pants approach. And uh, some folks like to do that. And in fact, when you've got more than 4,000 VAs, like say 10,000 VAs, for this kind of backup, you can back up a whole lot more. So therefore, like I say, this is a little old fashioned at the moment, but we're gonna get back into the 2023 here real soon now. But I just want everybody to understand the difference between DC coupled, AC coupled, uh, how the inverters interact with each other. <laughs> and, uh, then I think it'll be a lot easier to um, move on and see the rest. Now, what about the batteries? How are we going to select those? Well, we know the daily load requirements are 7.65 kilowatt hours. And we know that the 7.65, the inverter is at about 94%, maybe less. And then we got some wiring loss. So in order to get 7.65 kilowatt hours out of the inverter, you got to put in about 8.3. And of course, you use the numbers that are in the spec sheet. So the 0.98, the 0.94, uh, you get those right off your specification sheet. And if it's different, then you put in different numbers, but the procedure is the same. Um, the amp hours from the batteries to the inverter is going to be 8,300 watt hours, all right, 8.3 kilowatt hours. And you divide the kilowatt hours by the voltage, and that gives it the amp hours, 172.9. All right, now that's what goes from the, the batteries to the inverter, but you got, and in order to get this much from the batteries to the inverter, how much you have to put into the batteries? And that depends on the batteries. If the batteries have 80% depth of discharge requirement, well, that means that uh, 
you can only use 80% of the capacity of the battery. So instead of 172.9, we're up to 216 amp hours rating on the battery. Now these are our lead acid numbers, but again, we're looking at process here. The lithium numbers are significantly better. Uh, you, the loss coming out uh, is uh, more in the 5% range. And uh, you can allow, it's okay to allow 90% depth of discharge on lithium. And you know, lithiums last longer and they cost more. And But if you look at a life cycle analysis, nobody buys lead anymore. Uh, I mean, not, not, not very often out of the uh, uh, 10 or so megawatt hours of uh, storage that we have designed for residential in our company in the last couple of years. Uh, it's all been lithium. Uh, and even, even at 48 volts, it is uh, oftentimes uh, the 48 volt systems are also pretty much lithium. So if you want one day of storage, then you have to allow 24 hours for these 216 ampere hours to, to discharge. And you're not going to discharge all 216. But in any case, um, there's special batteries for this. Uh, AGM, if it's lead acid, but it's mostly going to be lithium. So let's don't even think about the AGM right now. And so, but but it is true that uh, way back when, uh, 216 amp hour, six volt uh, AGM lead battery was very common size. Um, and that's the deep discharge unit that uh, you don't start your car with it, you run your refrigerator with it. And uh, if you want to get 48 volts, six in series or eight of these in series gives you 48 volts. And if it's a lithium battery pack, then you simply order the lithium battery pack by voltage and kilowatt hour rating. Don't worry about these other numbers. And if you order something a little bit less than that, uh, uh, 8.3 kilowatt hour rating, uh, you're probably still going to be okay because the losses aren't nearly as much your round trip losses. Here's a question. Let's see what we got. If a battery is rated in amp hours, isn't that to the safe 80% discharge level? Uh, why up calculate it? Um, well, uh, my understanding, I might be wrong here, John, but uh, uh, everything I've read says that the ampere hour rating of the battery is from 100% to 0%. And they recommend you never go down that far, just stop at, at, at 20%. So uh, that that's the answer, and and uh, if they're rating now the lithium batteries generally rate at a hundred percent, and and so if a, if a lithium battery tells you you can have two hundred ampere hours from it, that's what you can get. All right, so that may be where the the uh, question is. The back in the lead acid battery days, uh, they loved to rate them at two hundred amp hours, even though you could only get one hundred and sixty out. But in the lithium days, which we're in now, the lithiums that you can get out what they say you can. Uh, for example, the end phase, not the end phase. Well, the end phase, they'll say you get 10 kilowatt hours. And indeed, that's what you get. Uh, if you look at the uh, Teslas, 13 and a half kilowatt hours, that's what you get. Or they'll maybe say it'll hold 14, but we're only rating it at 13 and a half. So effectively, they're rating it at what you can drain out of it without damaging it. So again, I uh, have to compliment you all on some really good questions today. I appreciate uh, uh, hearing those. Uh, actually, I'm not hearing them, I'm reading them, but about the same effect. Actually, much better effect because I can read better than I can hear. Uh, so, uh, and then here's the voltage kilowatt hour ratings, and they are the actual what you can get out. There's no no playing around with the lithium. Okay, and uh, they've got their own battery management systems, and uh, those battery management systems are really fussy. That they actually they don't measure the state of charge by the voltage. They measure the state of charge by integrating the amount of current that goes in on a cell by cell basis, and we're talking about individual cells about the size of a, a AA flashlight battery. 
or a double A TV remote battery. And so you have to put a whole lot of those into a 10 kilowatt hour battery, uh, like, like in the thousands. So, uh, and anyway, that's another problem for another day to figure out exactly how many cells you need to build a, a 10 kilowatt hour battery. And that's an interesting uh, thing in itself because the cells themselves are roughly three volts each. So to get to 48, that means you got 16 in series. And then uh, you got a whole, whole lot of them in parallel in order to get the number of amps that you want. So, We haven't said anything about the battery discharge rate. We've only said we need a certain number of kilowatt hours. But depending on the technology, there is a maximum rate at which you can discharge a battery. And uh, we're going to come across some uh, uh, AC type batteries that have all kinds of electronics inside. But uh, we need to talk about battery power as, as well as battery energy. And especially if you're talking about the really big systems, the 100 megawatt hour type battery systems, uh, they are built in order to have instant power, instantaneous power available, as well as having enough stored energy available. So uh, we have to pay some attention to that on average design, uh, if it takes 24 hours to remove 80% of the battery charge, that means that, that your average power over that is 345.6 watts. All right, that, you know, easy math here, but um, who uses power like that? I mean, nobody does. So uh, normally for lead acid, don't discharge the whole thing in less than you know, all 80% in less than five hours. Otherwise, you have too many losses in the internal resistance of the batteries. And uh, so that means 34.6 amps at 240 volts, 1,660 watts. So that'll still run your hair dryer and your microwave oven and a few things. But uh, it's not going to run your electric water heater. Uh, so... And unless that electric water heater, by the way, is a hybrid electric water heater, because if you run them in the hybrid mode, they use somewhere between three and 500 watts. And so you can actually heat water with these things. It takes longer, but you've got a coefficient of about four. So for every three units of electricity you put in, uh, sorry, every one unit of electricity, you get an extra three units of heat from outside. But again, that's another story. But if you you can't you don't necessarily have to rule out electric water heaters in your uh, backup if you in fact use the uh, water heating heat pump type or the uh, hybrid as they call them. So in any case, if you can't do what you need to do, uh, if you can't get more than sixteen hundred and sixty watts out of the battery at one time you may need a bigger battery pack. So even though you have enough kilowatt hours, you may not have enough kilowatts. And so that's the second final check you need to make to make sure your batteries will do what they need to do. Okay, and uh, lithium batteries, uh, two hour discharge time is no big deal. Uh, a lot of them are happy to charge, discharge on an hour or recharge on another hour. The thing about any battery is that there is a very rapid charge time, generally between about 20 and 80%, and then it slows down to get up to 100%. And if you want to do a neat experiment, just monitor your cell phone, plug it in, read the charge, mark the time, uh, collect the data for three hours, and you'll see a nice little curve that's that uh, uh, angles over to 100%. And that's pretty much how any of the batteries charge. They, they charge slower at the end, so they can cool down, so you can get a more accurate measurement of the actual state of charge, since that other complicating factor is state of charge depends on, on temperature. Okay, so then there's the solar part. How do you size the array? Well, uh, we need 172.9 ampere hours a day to, or, or 8.3 kilowatt hours a day to the, uh, the batteries. Well, that's what they have to deliver. But uh, 
typical round trip efficiency for batteries is roughly 90%. So divide 8.3 by 0.9, and you're going to need to generate 9.22 kilowatt hours a day with your solar system. So how do you do that? Well, uh, what you do is you go to a simulation program like the National Renewable Energy Lab's uh, system advisory model, which is free, by the way, and something every engineer should have for playtime, because it is really neat to simulate the amount of electricity you can get out of a, a, a photovoltaic system or a concentrating power system or a whole lot of other things, all for free. Just give them their email address because it's government sponsored, paid for with your tax dollar. And they want to make sure that Congress knows that all, all of us engineers, we've got copies of this to justify them improving it again for next year. So it, it's a really fun thing to play with. Uh, recommend it highly. It's a, a good therapy. So, uh, oh, oh, here we go, NRL Sam. So that's all you have to do is Google NRL Sam and it'll say, hey, how would you like to download a copy? And you say, absolutely, Roger said so. And uh, they say, oh, Roger did it. Well, <laughs> okay then. So here's analysis for the array. Let's say we're in Tampa. Uh, a 412 roof at 18.43 degrees. System design, we want 9.22 kilowatt hours a day. So that would be 286 in a month. If it's a 31-day month. So we just look on the simulation and see what does it take for 286 kilowatt hours in a month. And one way to do that is to pretend you've got a one kilowatt array. And let's see what that'll do, all right? And it turns out if you've got a nice uh, south facing array over there in Tampa, uh, it'll make 1,475 kilowatt hours a year for you. And 134 of those will be in August, and 119 will be in September, and 121 in October. Why do I say August, September, October? That's hurricane season, folks. And that's, if you're going to use these battery backup, this is going to be the time it's going to happen if you're in Florida. August, September, October. You want to make sure you've got the electricity you're looking for. All right, so uh, this isn't enough, but it's easy. This is linear. It's scalable. So we need to bring September up to 286. Okay, and uh, since September it's already getting 119, then we take 286 over 119, and that gives you 2.4 kW array. I need to tell you the average solar system that we have designed over the last three years or so has been 11 kW for residential. And we've designed about 10,000 of them. So uh, 2.4 kW is, is peanuts. And that's my point. Uh, that's why we can get past this uh, 2.4 kW, because if the average system you're going to put in for your house anyway is going to be 10, then you don't really have to mess around with all this, this, this load calculation and stuff. But the whole idea here is so you understand why you're doing this stuff. Uh, I, I happen to be teach electrical engineering for uh, 35 years, and I struggled to make sure that people weren't just memorizing how to do something. But why am I doing it? Because if I know why, then if somebody changes it, I'll probably have a whole lot quicker way to uh, understand why they changed it and what that did. Question. Where was that government publication available again? Uh, wh wh which government pub? Are you talking about the uh, 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 NREL SAM, the simulation program? Uh, tell me if that's what I'm, I'm going to say. If you're looking for the simulation program, just Google NREL SAM, and it'll pop right up in front of you. That's National Renewable Energy Labs System Advisory Model. OK, and uh, if you order up the set of these slides, uh, you'll be able to go to the slides that has NRL SAM on it and, and then just Google that, download it. And that's one of the best ways I know to have fun over Christmas if, if you don't want to drink. So uh, if uh, 
if that's not what you're referring to, please uh, pop that in the Q&A again and we'll try another shot. All right, so we need at least 2.4 kW and that'll do us for September. But if we want to make sure that when it snows in uh, Miami in, 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 uh, in, in January or, or in Tampa or whatever, then maybe we want to make sure that we have these 286 kilowatt hours available every single month of the year. And if we want to do that, then um, th th this is what the 2.4 kW does for August, September, and October. <clears throat> and uh, if we want 9.22 kilowatt hours a day every month of the year, and again, you do the math, it's simple addition, multiplication, subtraction, division, and you're going to increase from 222 to 286. And that simply means you increase your array by a factor of 1.29 up to 3.1 kW. Again, that's small change. It's one third the size of the typical uh, system that's out there these days that's going out there. And these systems are making electricity uh, the life cycle costs about uh, seven cents a kilowatt hour, depending on what direction you're looking and a few other factors, but seven cents is a fairly decent number. And that's uh, about half what most people are paying utility right now, which explains why lots of people want to put these systems in and also why a lot of people want to add some storage because there's a little money left over that they didn't realize they didn't have to spend just to get the power <clears throat> so throw in another ten thousand or something then you got this insurance policy which even oh uh, well we're going to come to some more interesting stuff in a little while what, what do we got for time here four o'clock okay so what are the constraints on the array well, maximum output of charge controller is probably around 3,200 watts, 60 amps, 53.3 volts. Um, again, this is for the old fashioned system. I'm gonna go through it fast. Charge controller, maximum input 150, da 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 da. All right, and I'm just gonna click this because again, for those of you who are really serious, go back over these again and make sure you understand them and it'll make it a whole lot easier for you when you, try to design a set Tesla system with their brand new inverter. Um, and here's some possible module choices. And, you know, this is what people used to go through. And we're not going to go through all this because you simply don't have to do it anymore. But it helps you appreciate the progress that's been made because uh, those of us old timers had to go through this to make sure the system was going to work correctly 15 years ago. But now we just skip it and we move on. So we're going to move on. And uh, again, you uh, want you to see that that's part of the way we, uh, that's how this whole process has evolved. Uh, there's a lot of temperature corrections necessary. Uh, and then again, we're not going to go through all lots of details here. Point is that as the modules get warm, they're, open circuit output voltage goes down. And as they get cold, their open circuit output voltage goes up. And they could go up if you're in a Northern state, as much as 10 to 12% above what the number says on the data sheet. So for example, a module with the say round numbers, 50 volts of uh, open circuit voltage. Uh, if it gets cold, they are gonna be up to around 55. Uh, if it goes down to about zero degrees Fahrenheit. So, and if you're in Northern Maine or something like that, then, then all bets are off. In any case, again, I'm gonna go, we're gonna go through these just quickly because I wanna to get to the systems, all right? So forget about that. Um, how do you wire it? Um, source circuits, short circuit current 10.97. Again, you're gonna get all these numbers off the data sheets. And once you have the numbers on the data sheets, you're going to look them all up in the National Electrical Code, take 125%, maybe do some derating, uh, and, and like, like for conduit fill and ambient temperature. Uh, but at this point, your derate either is the short circuit current times 125% or 
short circuit current divided by the but divided by the conduit fill rating divided by the ambient temperature rating, whichever is larger. Uh, okay, and again, that was just a bunch of words strung out, uh, but it's something that you don't have to worry a whole lot about right now because normally the inverters you're going to use tell you what your maximum open circuit voltage can be. And they've already done the, the math for you very conservatively to make sure that you won't get the voltage too high. And, and voltage is, is a nasty thing for electronic parts because if you have too high a voltage on an input of an inverter, uh, it, it can blow out the transistor there and uh, uh, then your, your inverter goes down. So you, you don't wanna do that. You don't want to have any voltages above the rated voltage, especially if it's a voltage input to the inverter. So uh, you check wire lengths and uh, per percent voltage drop. And again, this is for the guys who want to get serious about it. You come back and you read this over more carefully. All right. Um, so for wire sizing, you might correct for continuous duty. And again, you'll read this carefully if you're serious about it. Uh, but mainly we're going to get the concepts through here. And for those who want to go beyond that, uh, you'll have to come back to it another time, but uh, it'll be worth your time. So here's all the wiring and uh, operating current 10.44, 100 volts operating voltage DC. That's not very much, but again, this is one of the old time battery backup systems. So uh, again, here's a bunch of numbers in the table, uh, a little busy. But they're there so you can take a look at them just to see the kind of numbers you would come up with. All right, moving on. Got to put stuff up on the array. And here's a dozen modules mounted up on the roof. And we hope they won't blow away. All right, and so you're going to have a couple of rows of modules. And this one shows they're all within zone one. And, of course, the other book you really need if you're going to get serious about any kind of solar design is the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers, ASCE uh, 716 or 722, whichever one is uh, effective in your particular jurisdiction. Um, in any case, the blue area around the edge is that edge part and that's zone two. And uh, actually for a, a hip roof like this, there's uh, uh, the, Top of that is uh, is is zone two uh, R, and you got zone two N on the sides, and zone two E at the bottom. And uh, all these wind zones have different pressure coefficients that affect the amount of uh, of uh, uplift on on the array. So in any case, you're going to do wind wind analysis. You're going to make sure you put enough attachments on the roof so the stuff won't blow away. All right. And uh, I'm just going to quickly go through this because uh, this is a battery backup PV system design, not a array mounting system design seminar. So this is just rounds it out that this is part of the design process. Okay. And Tampa's got 140 mile an hour design wind and uh, the wind load. You see, there's 17.9 downward force or 38.8 uplift force. And from that, you can figure out exactly how many brackets you need and exactly how far the screws need to go into the roof or the trusses in order to hold that thing down when the wind blows 140 miles an hour. So, um, so you've got some numbers if it's something you want to come back and look at. Now, let's look at that standby loads distribution panel because there are a few little tricks involved in getting this thing wired and then moving the circuits from one panel to another. You're going to use a 12240 panel, and a 100 amp panel is good enough for what you've got here because you're feeding it with a, what was a 40 amp breaker or something like that. Um, you know the number of circuits you've got, so that tells you the number of pole spaces you need, and uh, you're going to want a main breaker in it. 
uh, because there may not be a place for that main breaker elsewhere. In other systems, there will be, and you will not need a main breaker in this panel. So again, it's going to depend on the system that you decide on. Um, you can move two-wire branch circuits by just moving the hot and neutral over to the new enclosure. Just disconnect it from the breaker where it is, a couple of wire nuts, send it on off, to the other panel and you've effectively wired it to the the, the new uh, backup panel and it's no longer present in the old panel uh, so two wire branch circuits no big deal and that can be done that way for either 120 uh, to ground or uh, 240 between uh, uh, the sort of thing you'd have on on a water heater but not the sort of thing you'd have on a dryer or a range that needs a neutral so uh, uh, but the two wire branch circuits can easily be moved. And th for that matter, you can, the three wire that has a neutral can be moved as well. Uh, but you just need to move all the wires. Um, and the, the interesting thing is the multi wire branch circuit, uh, the one where you got uh, uh, two lines and, and a single neutral. Uh, and there you need to make sure that the, if, if one side of a multi-wire branch circuit gets moved to the backup panel, the other side has to be moved there as well, because they're both supposed to be connected to a two-pole circuit breaker so that if you turn off one of those uh, sides, you have to turn off the other side. Uh, these are common, like if you're split between two bedrooms, but particularly when you've got a single circuit breaker, one half of which is running the garbage disposal, the other half of which is running the uh, dishwasher. And you get somebody lying on their back under the sink working on the power on those and they shut off the dishwasher. But this that double uh, gang box is still hot with the garbage disposal. And what a surprise that is to find a hot wire in that box. So you got to be a little more fussy with your multi-wire branch circuits. Um, otherwise, um, grid goes down, you're good to go in that uh, particular panel. And it's possible your inverter will come with a bypass switch so that you can run the utility straight to your speed, uh, standby loads and bypass the inverter. But that way, you don't get the backup from the inverter. That's only for maintenance purposes. So, another thing that happens, you're going to have an inspection. The inspector is going to look, make sure everything has got the correct arc fault and ground fault on those circuits that you've played with, and maybe every, every other circuit. And they might even require you to put a new smoke alarm in your master bedroom. So, these are things that uh, you need to be aware of what might happen in the local authority having jurisdiction. Uh, that need to be done in addition to your fancy new battery backup PV system. And there's equipment grounding and bonding and good old 250.122 has the rules. But again, these are all well-defined in the National Electrical Code. So again, for the really serious folks, uh, you're going to read that again another day if you're not sure. Um, Anything more than 80 volts on DC side, you need arc fault protection. Uh, typically a six by six by four, maybe sometimes an eight by eight by four rooftop junction box will be in there with 90 degree terminal strips, preferably, because most of the wiring on the roof is going to be open wiring with type TV, well, P like in Peter or a photo, V as in voltaic wiring, which has special ultraviolet resistant tough, wiring insulation a little bit thicker than the typical stuff, but it's open circuit and just kind of put in little racks along underneath the, the modules. They go up to a, a uh, junction box on the roof and they get spliced into some wire that runs down from the roof and conduit. Um, so again, a lot of stuff, just so you have an idea of what the voltages are, what the setting is for a charge controller. With the newer systems, you don't mess with the charge controller. It, it takes care of itself. But uh, 
the older ones uh, was something that you tried to optimize and oftentimes the owners tried to optimize it and they lost their batteries in five years instead of 10 years. But that's another story. Um, let's look at a schematic now of this 120-240. All right, it's probably gonna look something like this, the one we just designed, all right? It's got those 12 modules that we showed. They're gonna be in two strings of six each. They're going through that source circuit combiner box and you can see where they're actually not in two circuits of six, they're in four circuits of three. And that's because you need to keep that open circuit voltage below 150 volts. And these things are probably around 40 volts each if they are 60 cell modules. So you don't dare go more than three. So you got four circuits coming down each protected by a 15 amp circuit breaker. And they're going into, now this may not be quite exactly either what happens either because uh, most of the inverters now, uh, not all, but a goodly number of the inverters uh, are transformerless and they need to use an ungrounded array. And if that happens, then each of these wires is gonna have its own fuse. All right, so again, we're gonna, come to the newer stuff real soon. And here's what the circuit is for the one we just went into gory detail on. And now we don't have to go into quite as much detail on the other ones because we already know the, de the detail. So for example, rather than all the stuff we just looked at, we can put it all inside of one or so boxes like this one. And here's this yellow box is the inverter it's got a connection to the main distribution panel, all right? And in this one, your array can go up to 600 volts maximum instead of 150, that's four times as much voltage. And what that means is for the same amount of power, you've got one fourth as much current. And since losses are I squared R, you have one sixteenth. So you reduce your wiring losses, voltage drops by a factor of 16 by going up to 600 volt array instead of 150. So then there's a single DC connection out to the batteries and a single connection out the backup panel. <clears throat> but you notice you don't see any of this charge controllers and any of that stuff because it's all inside the yellow box. Okay. But if I had shown you this, First off, you wouldn't appreciate it. Now, uh, I can't, I'm just really curious here. I, I'm, I'm gonna look at participants. How many of you appreciate knowing how nice it is now to have the yellow box rather than about five other littler ones? You can raise your hand if you want. Wayne and Richard and Thomas and Charles and John and Joseph. Yeah, I mean, this is really a good deal, isn't it? Okay then, so uh, thank you for Actually, I did that for our, our, our host. He, he has to, I think, send in a report that everybody stayed awake through the whole system. Through the whole, I, I'm not sure that's really true, but uh, and anyway, I try to keep it. I'll do my best to keep it interesting. Uh, and and uh, if, if if it's not sufficiently interesting, uh, you can put a note. I was going to say it could go in Q and A. But, uh oh, there came one right now. I was thinking of some other places you could put that note, but okay, let's see. Don't electric utilities typically require a separate meeting of the PV? Uh, they they put in, they have to change out your meter uh, because if you have PV, you might be exporting some electricity to the utilities. And so they just need to keep track of the amount that goes to them versus the amount that comes to you. Now, other utilities have a production meter that they put right at the output of the PV. And that production meter measures every drop of electricity made by the PV. And they will pay you at a premium rate sometimes for that electricity that comes out of the PV. That They used to do that. That was called a feed-in tariff. But not, not, not very many peer, utilities are doing that anymore. They, uh, Right now, they don't need it as an incentive. So the yellow box, yeah, it's got over current protection in it uh, to the backup panel. Um, in some, a separate 
breaker is required. You have to look at the specs to see what's in it. All right, but but it is a possibility some do have, John. And some of them, uh, we're talking just this one system here, and there are some other ones that are even fancier, and I'm hoping we're going to get to them all. Okay, so uh, I'd like to go to a separate meeting. Uh, and the answer is, at least you're going to have separate meters such that it will me measure bidirectionally. Uh, and sometimes you'll have an extra meter that is, in fact, at directly at the output of PV, so they know exactly how much power uh, you are generating, and, and some of which, and much of which, may well be used by yourself. But that still is taking a load off the utility. If you're making it and using it yourself, you're not buying it from them. And if enough people do that at the right time of day, they might save themselves the bother of having to build a kind of power plant that they'd rather not build right now. Uh, of course, we're talking about residential battery backup systems here, but uh, if you go up into a certain area of Florida or go out into California, there's a, what is a 500 megawatt hour? I can't remember the numbers. Numbers are big, too big to fit in, too big to fit in my brain. But there's some huge battery storage out there on utility lines right now. Um, and because that's uh, cheaper to store the stuff you're not using than to build fossil plants. So that's what's happening. And that's a whole different webinar we do at some point of what's going on with the electrical system. So anyway, uh, here's a 21, 2021 DC coupled grid connected batteries backup system. Let's take a look at it. It's got your interruptible load panel, okay? Uh, utility coming in there. You got your inverter, DC to AC. You got your PV system going into the inverter. And you got some DC storage going into the inverter. Notice these are connected to the same bus bar. That means the DC storage is working, operating at the same voltage as the PV. And this could be 400 volts. All right, this is one, one system like this happens to use optimizers and fancy. I uh, tend not to use uh, uh, names of suppliers because I don't like to show any particular preference. There are lots of good ones out there. Uh, you kind of have to see whether they meet your specifications you're looking for. As long as they have their UL listings, they are acceptable for use in a system. So just read the spec sheet carefully. Uh, and then you got that standby panel because without standby panel, the uninterruptible loads, uh, the backup is not doing much good for them. And you notice that uh, that main uh, uh, panel there needs to have a switch in it that will open up. But anyway, here's uh, one existing panel, one new inverter, one new battery backup system, one new PV system, and one new standby panel. But that's not, well, there's a whole lot more than one part in a PV system, but uh, the way folks are able to uh, install them, uh, they, they strike those chalk lines up there in a hurry and get those holes drilled. And before you know it, you've got an array mounted on a roof, it takes maybe about a day. So uh, once they get at it, yeah, this goes pretty fast. Um, so this particular system has DC strings, but each string, each module, each individual, no, no, this is not each module, but the strings are optimized with DC to DC optimizers. And what they do is they adjust, uh, they, they are DC to DC converters. So they convert DC at one voltage and one current into DC at another voltage and another different current such that the products are about the same. So power in equals power out, about 99% efficient. And what they do is they match up the string voltages so that even if uh, one of the strings is facing in a different direction, the optimizer is gonna make sure that that uh, string puts out as much power as it possibly can 
And uh, so the, each of the two strings might, each one might deliver a slightly different amount of power to the inverter, but they're delivering it at the same voltage. So therefore, when you put voltages in parallel, everything is happy. All right. So uh, storage is DC, but it's got DC to DC converter because you're storing it at something around 400 volts, even though the batteries inside that little pale blue box are probably about 48 volts. The in and out voltage is going to be at about 400. And imagine that uh, when your voltage is a whole lot higher, instead of having two watt wire uh, out of the storage in and back, uh, you're able to use number 10 uh, because your uh, current drops down to something in the neighborhood of, of uh, 20 amp range, depending on whose system you use. Okay, so. Uh, these optimizers also, when they see that the inverter is no longer putting out AC, the inverter sends a message up to the optimizers because the inverter controls the optimizers. And again, these are electronic gadgets. And it tells them, hey, the uh, utility went down. And according to UL1741, uh, you guys shut down. Uh, unless this is legitimate. Uh, system, but if you need to shut down the array at the roof during a power outage, because it's going to be on, uh, there's a special switch that turns off called a rapid shutdown switch. And uh, if there's some emergency responder up on a roof and you flip that switch, then there's no power that's leaving the array, the boundaries of the array. Here's an all in one DC coupled system. <clears throat> right here. And that's the one you just saw the schematic of. And would you believe that that inverter is rated at 7,600 watts? That's not very big, but the batteries are kind of big. And they are up, I don't know. These batteries are capable of having, I think, three different, they, they add increments in about kilo, five kilowatt hours each. So each of those can be about 15 kilowatt hours of storage. Actually, I think they go up to 18. So six, uh, and then with two of them, we've got 36. So that's a lot of backup. Well, you saw that eight kilowatt hours of backup does a pretty good job. If you got 36, you just might be backing up your entire house. All right, you know, here, why do I guess at it? 8.6, 11.4, 14, three or 7.1 kilowatt hours, four different configurations. And they're uh, 46.8 volts and they're good. Uh, and each battery is good for three kilowatt hours. Um, so we got 281 volts DC, uh, round trip battery, some numbers. But the main thing is what you get out of the batteries. And uh, what you get out of the batteries is a relatively high voltage DC that is fed to the inverter at the same voltage the array is coming down at. Lots of good fancy array monitoring and control or system monitoring and control. So here's some alternative basics. How do we do it? Now look, 429, half hour left. No, actually we start at two minutes after. So uh, we get an extra two minutes. Um, the other way, rather than starting with the load first, a lot of people like to just look at the roof and say, how much can we put up there? And then you configure the array and maybe you use modules with microinverters. Each module has its very own microinverter. And what that does is the every module is optimized with the microinverter. And the microinverter being current sources, they're all connected in parallel, currents in parallel add. Voltage of the system is 240 volts AC. So that's what's coming down off the roof out from underneath the modules because that's where the microinverters are. Pretty fancy. A little more expensive, but really incredibly fancy and reliable. Microinverters themselves now have 25 year warranties. Um, <clears throat> figure out what the AC power is out is going to be. And that's simply going to be n times the number of uh, inverters times the rated power of each inverter. Uh, 
that might be 290 watts, 325 watts, uh, 349 watts. Um, all depends on, on which one you decide you want to use. And some are even more than that. And then uh, normally you'd want the AC output rating about 67% of the AC rating of the array. <clears throat> that was good up to about a year ago and now that all changed again they've uh, developed an improvement on the module on, on the microinverter the reason for this rule right here the 67 percent rule is that the previous microinverters were a little harder to back off and when the batteries were up close to being fully charged the excess pv coming out of the microinverters had to be bypassed and shut off. So, but now with the next uh, version of the microinverter, you don't need to do that. The microinverters themselves are smart enough to shut down when the batteries come close to 100% charge. All right, so this is a, uh, like I say, if I were to change this thing tomorrow and present it next week, there will still be something different. And that's why I emphasize once again why it's so important to understand the basics of how these things work, because then it's a little bit easier to follow the manufacturer when they make their changes and improvements. Okay, so again, here's your process. Uh, you find a roof, looking for some modules on it, and put some modules on. And there's some there, five, uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or whatever. And but maybe you put a few over here too. And uh, the, the ones on the first ones, of course, going on the south side, and they probably make electricity for about uh, maybe seven cents a kilowatt hour. The east ones probably goes up about eight cents a kilowatt hour. And guess what? You can do the simulation on NREL SAM to see whether it's worth it to put these on the on the east roof here. And for that matter, the ones on the west roof. And not even that, but you might even want to put some on the north side. It's unbelievable. I never would have believed anybody's put any modules on the north side roof 20 or 15 years ago. <clears throat> but now, at least here in Florida, uh, we can justify modules on north roof and they will uh, pay for themselves at a rate about of nine cent electricity instead of seven cent on the uh, uh, six or seven cents on the south roof. So they don't make as much. Uh, you make maybe a thousand kilowatt hours per kilowatt per year on the north roof and fifteen hundred on the south roof. You still make two thirds of uh, on the north of what you make on the south. And uh, if you need the electricity, or if that's the way your house is oriented, maybe some is better than none. Uh, and you can do the math to analyze whether it's worth it. Anyway, um, and then we have to decide how to connect these modules. And uh, if the microinverters are 290 watts, very common size, uh, then you're going to have 240 volts AC and maximum current output of 1.21 amps. Uh, and they act as current sources. So a 20 amp circuit means you can put 13 of these on it. And why 13? 13 times 1.21 is just under 16. Well, that's because your circuit has to be designed at 125% of the maximum current output. That's how you just you design your wire and your overcurrent protection. So you're looking at 20 amp circuits with minimum number 12 wire. And I don't know what happens in your neighborhood, but uh, most people down here have been so used to using number 10 wire for wiring uh, arrays that they wouldn't use anything different from that no matter what, even though oftentimes number 12 is more than enough. So in any case, you get 13 of these on a single circuit. So notice these are marked one, two, and three, and four, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and uh, eight threes, and two, and four, six, and six or 12 number ones, and three, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 number two. So, this another thing that's important is that the length of the strings don't have to be the same because of the current sources in parallel. 
you get the 1.21 amps maximum or less than that out of each micrometer that you see in front of you here. We have a question. What do we got? Uh, if the north facing modules make two thirds of the kilowatt hours of south, wouldn't the effective cost? Yeah, what did I say? Three halves. Yeah. Well, three halves of six is nine. So uh, that's that's relatively close. Um, but you're right. You you yeah, you must use a calculator to figure that out that closely. But yeah, it's about fifty percent more, uh, or, or the value. They make about two thirds as much electricity. And, you know, a lot of people don't want to do that, but some people that's about all they can do because that's the direction most of the roof is facing. Uh, back in 2010, I took a job with some former students trying to convince architects that in 2020, you could be able to make electricity cheaper than you could buy it from the utility and you would really be doing your clients a favor by giving them a fair amount of south-facing roof. Anybody want to listen to that? Nah. So you have a house with 10 roof sections, and maybe 10% of the total roof is facing south. And uh, that, that's a little crazy. So, but, but, but it is what it is. And uh, at least now for those folks, uh, they can be making eight, eight or nine cent electricity instead of seven or six. So anyway, how do you connect the modules? And here is one way you can do it. And uh, But it's okay because of the microinverters. You just don't want more than 13 in, in, in a single string. Uh, it's convenient to group the, the modules, the fours together on that one roof, the threes on the other roof without stretching some of the ones over to the threes. And it's also significant uh, from a voltage drop in efficiency that you don't feed these strings from the end, but you feed them from the middle. So that on a string with eight modules in it, you connect it to the, uh, the ground with connecting in the middle with four modules going one direction, four going the other direction. That means you only have half as much current from each side but it's even more significant than that because every time you add another module, you add another 1.21 amps. That's if they're working at total total capacity. And, and so by the time you get to the end, you've got a fair amount of current. All right, that's uh, some of the finer points there. In any case, uh, 13 times 1.21 times 1.125%, 19.7 amps. Use your number 12 or number 10 wire in your 20 amp circuit breaker and you're good to go. Um, combine the outputs of the four circuits. What do you got? You got 9.68, 9.68 for the eight module circuits and 1452 for each of the 12s. This doesn't show a grounding conductor, but it means that uh, your AC power rating is going to be 11.6 kW. Your DC power rating is going to be 14.8 kW. And you think, well, gee, that's kind of silly. You're going to waste uh, 3.2 kW. But uh, no, you're not going to do that because as that array gets warm, the power output of the modules goes down. So when the sun is shining directly on it, wanting to make it maximum power, guess what happens? They get hot and they don't put out maximum power anyway. And rarely does the, uh, the module put out more than 80% of its rated power. And that's why the utilities, when they try to give an AC rating to your, your system, they don't rate it the AC output uh, according to the DC input because they know that in the afternoon or in early morning or, or even almost overhead, there's always a reason for the module not putting out its rated power. And that's why you don't, you, you talk about the power rating, but what really counts is the number of kilowatt hours it's gonna make in a year's time. And that's how you justify your math because that's what you're paying for anyways. You're paying for the kilowatt hours unless you're in a commercial with a uh, general service demand rate or something, but uh, you can do the math on those equally as well. And that's why commercial systems are selling uh, like hotcakes as well. So 370 watt modules, if you got 40 of them, that's 14,800 watts. And you notice that fits really conveniently on a, on a house and without even using the north roof. 
And I've been telling you about uh, about 11,000 as being the average size we have, so that we've been designing. So 290 watt maximum microverters. Yeah, 11,600. There's your AC rating, DC to AC ratio of 1.28. Uh, and that means, uh, you, it turns out you can have a DC to AC ratio of pretty close to uh, 1.4 with almost no losses. So there's no need to upsize all the inverters and everything in the wire because your loss of the year is maybe 1%. And uh, you can lose a percent a whole lot of other ways if the array gets dirty or anything else. So in this microinverter, even though it's 290 watts, you can connect modules with ratings up to 440 watts and the microinverter is happy if the module tries to get more than 290 watts to the microinverter, um, the microinverter just says, hang on, uh, I'm gonna take 290, that's it for now. And maybe it'll last for an hour, I would like to give it 300. Uh, so you lose uh, 10 watt hours over that period. So, uh, Here's your DC to AC ratio thing. Um, <clears throat> this is a single 290 watt microinverter with different size modules. All right. And this is a simulation of the, the annual output for different module ratings. And this is based on our friend Sam. And here's what you got. This is Orlando, 18 degrees south. And notice a nice linear output. The, the output of these things in annual kilowatt hours is linearly proportional to the rating of the modules, up to 440 watts, almost exactly linearly rated. So when somebody says, oh, you, I got to have my inverters the same size as modules, well, you go to Sam and show them what it is, and then they they want to do that. They just spend a little extra money, but doesn't do them extra. It doesn't, doesn't justify it. Do you need to consider voltage drop when you have multiple wire in one conduit? When you have multiple wires in one conduit, voltage drop is a different story. There are two things you have to consider with multiple wires in one conduit, and that's the uh, conduit fill derating for four to six, you need you, you drop down to 0.8 uh, factor. You have to um, multiply by 0.8 of the rating of the wire. Uh, seven to 10, you're at 0.7 and above 10, you're at 0.5 for conduit fill. And then I don't have the, the uh, table memorized for the, the uh, temperature derating because that's about every five degrees you drop down uh, <clears throat> a few percent in what you're allowed. But that's all in, uh, in Article 310 of the National Electrical Code, the, the amount of what your deratings are uh, right near the ampacity tables. But uh, good, good question. Voltage drop you want to consider simply because you don't want the voltage drop to be more than 2% on any DC side or AC side. Uh, because if the voltage drop is basically that amount of percent is the amount of percent of power you're losing. So that's where you don't want to lose it is on voltage drop. So you on, on a bigger system, uh, anything with wire runs over 100 feet or so, you want to pay some attention to voltage drop. Under 100 feet with a 200 volt system with microinverters, it's, it's not an issue. Okay. Minimum recommended storage. 10 kilowatt hours of storage, you can get 3.84 kVA out. In other words, uh, 3.84, 3840 divided by 240 gives you the amount of current. 3840 divided by 240, that gives you 16 amps, okay? <clears throat> so this is with one particular manufacturer. now. This very same manufacturer now for a five kilowatt hour storage, it will give you 3.84. So in other words, the amount of power, the ratio of power to kilowatt hours is, is twice as high. They've got more inverters. Uh, and, and that's uh, for people who want that power for short durations. 
uh, and aren't too worried about the amount of storage. Uh, and as, particularly when you're looking about starting currents and things, then the, this is something you may want to look at is that five kilowatt hour version it has its 3.8 fork uh, kilovolt ampere maximum output. Okay, wait a minute, check the time. 446. Okay, we got 16 minutes and three seconds left. All right, uh, maximum array power. Uh, again, this is 150% of it, but that's with the older model of the microinverter. Okay, so uh, uh, now you can have your array power anywhere up to maximum AC current out of 80, uh, sorry, 64 amps. So uh, you can go up as high as 64 amps and uh, for any amount of storage with this particular system now. Uh, but right, right now, rather, rather than a maximum AC power, this would be more of a minimum AC power. So just make a note of that, okay? Uh, well, like I say, this is a year old now, so don't do it that way anymore. And again, I'm going to chime in one more time. reason we're talking about all this detail is because these things do change so often that you kind of need to understand what you're working with in order to know uh, what's happening. And you feel a whole lot better rather than just scratching your head. Oh, now why, what, what? Anyway, if you need, if you got 11.6 kW array, and if you divide it by uh, 5.76, that is what, in, in, in any case, every time you have another 10 kilowatt hours of storage, you get an extra 16 amps out and, and of, uh, of instantaneous power. Most of the storage is lithium these days. And uh, they've got battery management systems and they just absolutely short that thing out and you get 16 amps, that's it. Uh, everybody would, nobody would try that with an automobile battery without wearing some pretty heavy duty uh, uh, flash gear. And uh, <clears throat> again, they, they change this all the time right now uh, at the time, depending on which model of the unit, you could daisy chain them, two of them. <laughs> They've kind of gotten away from that now and uh, generally run each one in its own single back bed. 10 amp or 20 amp circuit breaker in a combiner box instead. But again, you just need to follow the data sheets. What kind of backup, partial or whole? Well, we've talked about partial or whole. And, and, and if you're going to have more than, uh, if you only have 32 amps available, then you don't dare have a 40 amp circuit breaker because 40 amp breaker, maximum current, 125% rule, 32 amps. So you got to either shut them off manually before your system switches over or do something. Otherwise, you're going to overload the system. And you don't want to do that. If you have a fossil generator, it can't run simultaneously with the PV. So the PV has to be connected on the line side of the automatic transfer switch if there is one. A uh, reason for that is the PV uh actually prevents any uh dc from coming back into it unless it's a whole lot higher but the fossil generator if you've got excess ac that's not being used by your loads it's going to want to go to the generator which means it's going to try to run the generator as a motor which is trying to run the try to run the prime mover backwards and that is not a happy situation so you have to be really careful if you have uh, fossil generators available to make sure that they can't simultaneously interact with the PV. Uh, now, there are ways that fossil generator can be on while the PV is on, but it's some interesting switching you need to do to make sure you don't damage the generator. Um, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, during the day, the PV power will also be available in addition to the batteries. So, uh, but, but some of that PV power is going to be needed to recharge the batteries for the next night. But there may be some extra PV power during the day. Um, so configure the system controller. Oh, so what's the system configuration mean? Well, here's your 
your roof and here's your circuit combiner and that comm thing is a communication link that uh, that's the power line carrier communication setup that actually monitors every individual module in the system and reports out to whoever wants to know how much power it's generating at that particular instant. And furthermore, it integrates that and you can get the cumulative energy that's being generated. Kind of neat. Then you're back feeding a 60 amp breaker in your system controller. Now, what's that system controller? Well, a system controller, it has that set of contacts up there that opens up when the grid goes down. And it has input from the AC output of the microinverters in that 60 amp there. And what's this other circuit breakers there? Uh, well, maybe, oh, there's 20 kilowatt hours of storage and that connected to a backfed 40 amp breaker. This is AC. And these storage have their own inverters inside and the inverters there are special inverters that will turn on instantly if the utility goes down. So that's kind of a special thing. And, and that's not necessarily the case with other inverters, not necessarily the case with the inverters and the microinverters. They might have to wait for five minutes before they turn on. Others will come on immediately, it depends on which version you get. In any case, the storage does replace the utility instantaneously if the utility goes down. And so here's your utility coming in up here. And here's the backup panel down here. And here, you notice we've got partial backup, 175 amp service. We're connecting 125 of that to the system controller. And you were asking a question about, somebody was asking a question about where do the circuit breakers go? Here's a case where the system controller can have its very own circuit breaker. And this circuit breaker can be service rated <clears throat> 25,000 AIC. Let's see, questions, let's see what we got. And by the way, if your chats are questions, please put them in the Q and A. Uh, discuss costs for system. Um, you know, I could discuss them. Uh, the PV part is typically neighborhood of $3 a watt. Then you get a 30% discount. So you're down to $2.10 a watt for just the PV part. Uh, prices I'm hearing for 10 kilowatt hours of storage are in the neighborhood of uh, uh, $10,000, 10 to $12,000 for a 10 kWh. And so uh, that, that's the best I can do, unfortunately. These things uh, change. Let's see, pros and cons of the PV system. Um, well, now, you mean the whole system PV plus storage? Um, this is an AC-coupled system because notice we're coming down from the roof with AC. So that's, that's a good thing because that means uh, the path to the backup panel is very low loss. It's highly efficient. The microinverters themselves are not necessarily quite as efficient as a string inverter. There are trade-offs, and these all are system-specific to be able to say which is better. And so pros and cons of the system. Um, well, there's something we haven't even talked about yet, and that is another one of the... Uh, <clears throat> the, the nice features here is that the IEEE 1547-2018 <clears throat> allows for utility to talk to your system. And if it's five o'clock in the afternoon and they really need some additional electricity to, to help them offset their peak load, they can talk to your storage system and say, hey, guys, can you, uh, we, we know that you, you're capable of giving us 32 amps and about 75 watt, 75 K, sorry, seven and a half uh, KW. Would you mind sharing that with us for an hour? And, and we'll pay you good money for that, like maybe 25, 30 cents a kilowatt hour. And, and the storage things, they kind of look at each other and they nod their head or wave or whatever. 
And, and within about a, a millisecond, well, about less than a second, they've negotiated a price of uh, utility of electricity we sold back to the utility to, to help stabilize the grid. <clears throat> uh, typical Tesla Powerwall storage voltage is 122.40. Typical power or volt amperes is 13.5 uh, kilowatt hours. And uh, most of these things, uh, batteries, controllers, inverters, uh, have lightning protection, yeah. They're mostly built in. You need to check the, the data sheets about whether you have uh, lightning protection. Okay, let's see. Okay, so here's uh, here's your system. It's a partial backup. Um, but partial backup with 20 kilowatt hours of storage pretty much covers everything. Then, in fact, the only reason we have this uh, other breakers up here is these would be the ones that are more than 40 amps. Because with these particular storage units, maximum storage 32 amps. And if you got to have some load that wants more than that, you got to get it off the uh, off the backup system. So, okay. Contacts open when utility is lost and the system's on its own. All right, got to check here a little more frequently on time here, 4.57, five minutes and we have to be done. Okay, let's take a quick look at possible operating loads of the AC coupled systems. One, if the grid is up and the, and the sun is up, fine. They make electricity and the excess goes to the grid. Grid up, sun down. Well, obviously, if PV is not making any electricity, so everything's fed by the grid. Grid down, sun up. Well, that means uh, your battery backup inverter at this disconnect from the grid, and whatever power is being made by your photovoltaic system is either going to be used for charging batteries or running loads. And uh, as long as you don't overcharge the batteries, uh, you're fine. And as long as whatever, for whatever reason, you don't over discharge, you're fine as well. And number four is grid down and sundown. <clears throat> and there the batteries take over and they have to make sure to make it through the night. And it's up to the uh, battery backup inverter to, uh, or, or, or the hybrid inverter to make sure that it can tell the Microinverters in this particular case come back on in the morning. And there's a number five that's not listed here. And that's what I was just telling you about that now it is possible for you to sell electricity to the utility at a premium rate when they need it. Because they have to pay an awful lot of money if they have to turn on a uh, uh, natural gas generator for a short time. Uh, your duty cycle, if your duty cycle is short, for something that has expensive fuel, then you've got to make up the cost of the, uh, that fuel and the initial operating installation cost by charging more for that electricity. But you got to do something to make sure everybody gets what they need, even during peak load time. So lots of interesting stuff's going on these days there. What about the power wall? Here it is, right here. Uh, you got utility, main disconnect, you got some interruptible loads. A power wall can, in fact, do whole house backup. Uh, we've done systems with uh, up to four power walls. That gives you uh, uh, 54 uh, kilowatt hours of backup. Uh, and that's uh, 120, 240-volt AC because the arrays, uh, the power wall itself, as you can see, it has a built-in rectifier and inverter. Uh, AC in rectified to DC, DC out inverted to AC. So here's your power wall and here's some information on it. <clears throat> the array can use straight grid connect inverter or it can use micro inverters. And uh, the power wall people gotten into the business of making their own uh, straight grid connect inverters as well, but they have not get on, gotten into the micro inverter business yet. So, in any case, a um, few, few operating details here. Um, and you can see all this in the, the, the diagram here anyway. That automatic relay there isolates the rest of the system. <clears throat> no, the automatic relay, 
the uninterruptible loads in the combiner panel can be acquired all in one box. Um, the power wall, of course, has its own inverters. The PV inverters could be micro inverters. So there's a power wall system, at least one version of it. How does it operate? It's an AC coupled battery backup system, a whole house or specific standby loads, your choice. <coughs> and here's your four situations. And it simply means that uh, the tar wall, another thing, and, and, and most, most of the systems now are, are equipped to do this. And here's that uh, system we saw on the very first slide with the covers on. And there's your gateway, combiner panel, standby load panel. <clears throat> and that's your PV coming in from the grid connector inverter. And here's, uh, that was, you could see the power walls. Um, AC module storage with storage. Here's uh, 26 kilowatt hours of storage. AC PV combination. This is your rapid shutdown switch that even though your backup comes on seamlessly when the grid goes down, if you have to turn off the grid, you have a button you can press that does that. Um, let's see, that's your grid automatic disconnect. That other switch in there is the one that goes off when you hit the rapid shutdown because then that shuts off your AC supply from the modules uh, to the system. And uh, it also shuts down the, the rapid storage. So, uh, fossil fuel generators, yeah, we mentioned them earlier. They can be incorporated. The instruction book tells you how to do that. If the array is oversized right now, we don't worry about it. Unless it's more than 80 amps for a particular system, you just bypass and go straight to a uh, uh, connection, uh, a, a line side tap, as it's called. And this is all in uh, uh, chapter uh, 705. Point twelve of National Electric Code gives you all the different ways you can connect in. So again, excess PV is not a big problem now. It was a year, year and a half ago, but not now. Some of the battery backup systems will scale up pretty big. Again, you got to read the instruction books. So now what? More communication control, more sophisticated utility bidirectional interaction, integration with other sources and systems. One thing that's going to be interesting is electric vehicles, because they've got like up to 100, 100 uh, kilowatt hours of storage in a big Tesla. Uh, how about the moon, sun, planets, stars, whatever? Anyway, uh, this is probably a hint that we're about done. How do we do on time here, folks? 504, one minute over, huh? Well, anyway, that's where we're headed. Now, as I mentioned here, uh, I'll just flick here, but there's a bunch of, uh, <clears throat> exam a couple of additional examples of larger systems here, uh, like this one, for example. So if you want to get these and take a look at them, uh, just order up the, uh, the slides follow the instructions in the chat box. And I thank you all for joining us today. And uh, here's all the information you need from the, the boss up there in, in Maryland. Wait a minute, I'm, I'm sorry, I think he's in Virginia. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, if, uh, I noticed. Uh, all right, we'll work this out on, on the slides. Like I say, these things get uh, updated so often that it's almost hard to keep track. So, uh, and I do have to answer this call here. Just hold on a second. Hi, are you there? Hey, Roger. Yeah, where, where are you? I'm um, downstairs, but I just wanted to ask, what's um, your unit number? 
501. 501? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Come on up. I'm, not, I'm just finishing up my webinar, so I'll be out in about five minutes. All right. Okay. Come on up. Jane will let you in. Okay. Well, I guess we, uh, my, my next uh, job for the day is here. Here we go. Okay. And uh, Hisham, I'll make sure you get a copy of this particular set of slides. Uh, I'll probably have to convert it to PDF to make it uh, small enough to send. And thanks again. Happy holidays, everybody. Don't eat too much of that turkey. And uh, hope to see you again for a future webinar. We've got a couple more left in case you haven't uh, sat in.